Really smart people think they know the answer and they never do. They always get it wrong. And they think that the people who have the problem are just dumb. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> so the issue is what's the real problem, right? And finding that is hard to do. So there's a number, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. You have to walk down a lot of dead, dead ends. So you have to give yourself a lot of room for the first letter in our, in our little pseudonym, uh, create, which is to clarify. Jeff DeGraff is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Inside Ideas of Innovators Magazine. Jeff is both an advisor to Fortune 500 companies and a professor at the Rose School of Business at the University of Michigan. You can see it from his hat. His <laughs> simultaneous creative and pragmatic, pragmatic approach to making innovation happen has led clients and colleagues to club him the Dean of Innovation. He has written several books, including Leading Innovation, Innovation U, and The Innovation Code. His most recent book, The Creative Mindset, Bring six creativity skills to everyone and is now available for sale. Jeff is a business owner, professor, and author. He says, everyone is creative. We are just creative in different ways and in a wide variety of situations. Believe you are, are creative is the first step to mastering and a creative mindset. Once you do that, you can make innovation happen anywhere and any time. He's also very fortunate, and I haven't really heard him talk about this a lot, but Stanny is his wife and <laughs> business partner, and they run a lot of innovation together, and uh, hopefully we can pull out of them about his three kids, if it's three kids, I don't think they've had any more, but uh, um, I have read Jeff's other books, and uh, I like his new book and the six step process for mastering a creative mindset, um, as well as um, the innovation code, which I, I really loved. I also loved his uh, Google talk um, uh, about the innovation code and some of the things that he brought out, you know, the risks of trying something radical, starting at the edge or the perimeter and how some large clunky organizations get into bureaucracy and and they really don't need to be disrupted. They kill themselves because they're not agile and willing to move. And we're going to get into those six skills of creativity and the book and talk about many, many things today. But I'd like to welcome my guest, Jeff. Thanks for being on the show. Mark, thanks for having me on. It's so good to, to have you here. And I really want to start out with the, the, the first question in it. It is a leading question, so but I won't make it a, any secret. So you've been doing this for a long time at, at the academic and university level. You've been writing books. You've been working on creativity, innovation, and business for a long time. I want to know, has that helped you to weather this pandemic? Has it given you the skills, you and your family, to be prepared to weather this crazy time to say, hey, we're sustainable, we're resilient through, through this crazy time where we were prepared because innovation usually gives you a little foresight on, on what could come and what we could do to, to do that or maybe innovations pop up at, in, in times like this. So I guess that's my first question. How have you and the family weathered the pandemic? Well, first of all, I think, um, I don't know if my, if my innovation skills have helped. What's helped is, you know, I'm one of those two million mile guys on Delta. I spend a lot of time in hotel rooms around the world. So, you know, you think on a yearly basis, I'm probably in a hotel 75 days of the year by myself. So the first thing is I'm used to being by myself, even though I have a, a lovely family. When you write, you're by yourself. When you're in your hotel room, you're by yourself. Plus, it doesn't hurt to have a great spouse and a terrific family, right? That. So I, I think there's something kind of, disingenuous about how we've been able to do this. We have a, we have a large house and it's, it's in a nice area. I think the more intriguing uh, issues are how people who are kind of um, scraping by have done this. And what I'm seeing is incredible imagination, you know, 
learning pods and, and daycare shifting and and uh, all you know you you can't take the bus now so alternative ways of getting to work I think that's where you know as Whitman said I hear America singing I think that's the group that's been remarkable I think the other side of it is all of our large bureaucracies have failed I mean think about this for just a minute think about how our federal government right the the whole notion of COVID, where, where we, we account for the largest amount of deaths, the largest amount of cases, the only comparable places that they're looking at that are similar to us are Brazil, Mexico, and India, which of course are all sort of emerging countries, <laughs> not exactly want. But then I want you, your listeners to think about something. I want you to think about while our governments, our universities, our most esteemed bureaucracies, including mine, fail, I want you to think about 595 creativity clusters started to emerge. 595 groups of startup people, students, maybe a couple of street people, I don't know. And they got to 116 of them got to phase one trials. And then 54 got to phase two. We now have six at the end of phase three. We'll probably have a, a dozen more by the time we're done. And drug discovery is going to go from 10 years for a new virus, a vaccine discovery, to about 14 months, a tenth of the time. The key to this is while our large bureaucracies failed, these 595 creativity clusters got together organically. And what they were able to do, accomplish was unbelievable. And usually it's the old that assimilates the new. So usually the bureaucracies would say, here's how much money I'm giving you. It worked the other way around. Think about what Moderna did and some of the other people did. They basically you said to the government, no, you're going to give us this amount of money because we have to develop and deliver this to 7 billion people around the world in two doses. And so what's happening is usually the old assimilates the new. But in a crisis where an event happens beyond the bureaucracy, the new assimilates the old. Can you imagine being at the FDA today after seeing how this got discovered and thinking you're gonna put that genie back in the bottle or a higher education institution, yeah. it's not gonna happen. So the notion is what we're seeing, even though it's tragic, I don't wanna make it sound like it's nice. It's horrible, people are dying, it's terrible. But on the other side of it is we're seeing a radically different approach to solving problems. And I love that. And that, that's what you really, you talk about that a lot in the innovation code. The, the other thing that uh, maybe a lot of our listeners don't know as well is um, the creative mind book that you, you, you've just come out with that I had talked about in, in the beginning. Actually, I think at the, the launch date for Germany, where I'm at, uh, came out the 29th of September. So, you know, right, right in the thick of Think of things, and, and uh, you're not the only one. There's been several other authors that I've spoken to or that I've had on the show. Same thing, you know, book launch and, and, and during a pandemic where, you know, there's not a lot of book tours. It's all it's all going online. Um, I, I imagine most of those people have weathered that pretty good because they're innovators, they're creative, they're used to the digital media, media, they're futurists. So so there's a quick pivot. Um, in the in the media area, so films and, and uh, documentaries, I've had those as well. I, I, matter of fact, I had a documentary that came out, and it was dead in the water. It, the documentary is called Now, and I said we we should change the name to Yesterday because by the time that people see this, it's it's out of date, you know, because no movie theaters, no premieres, no nothing, and and so that that's the other thing that's happened during this time. And so I wanted to know how how that shift has gone and how you've gotten the word out for your book. And maybe you've got a copy there you could hold up for us and maybe tell us a little bit about it as we ease into the show. So yeah, creative mindset. Yeah, so um, let me just, before I do that, let me back up on something. Sure. It's really funny, I, uh, when, when this all started here in this country in March, in America in March, um, I got a call from PBS. And I when I was a much younger man, I used to be on the, um, <clears throat> the advisory board for public broadcasting here in America. And uh, used to have an NPR program and a PBS program and all that stuff. And, and the, what I basically said was, uh, you're going to become irrelevant very quickly if you can't figure out how to deliver educational training to uh, through K through 12, the young people at home. And, um, you know, bureaucracies are notoriously slow. So this didn't, this didn't, uh, this didn't play well at first, but I had a 
wonderful partner, or not partner, person, a point person at PBS named Rich Homburg. And um, he was able to free, if you know, uh, a lot of these uh, government agencies have a lot of excess bandwidth. He was able to free up some yeah. bandwidth. And it took a long time, but basically now for those people who are underserved and don't have broadband at home, PBS is able to deliver some of this stuff over cable and over the air, which of course makes this far more accessible and far more democratic, which I'm very proud about. I think, I think um, when it comes to book tours and things like buying a physical book, <laughs> I've, I've, to be honest with you, Mark, I've never done them. Um, I've just, I've just, uh, I've been in over half the Fortune 500, and usually the way my books sell, you're not going to see them a lot on. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I seldom make the Times bestselling list. What happens is uh, clients are trying to solve a problem and they end up uh, using your material to solve the problem. I'm very, I'm very big on the idea for this book being very uh, accessible. So what I've done for this book is I've made 15 videos. I've made them for free. There's no catch. And I've made a whole bunch, all the slides and a syllabus and everything you need, because what I'm trying to do is to give teachers who are at home with COVID, I'm trying to give them tools and saying, hey, you know, um, if you want to have an online class and get people to do something really spectacular where they're making at home, um, here's a kit to do it. Because my big thing, Mark, uh, we've talked about this. My big thing is the democratization of innovation. I'm really big on the idea that what's happened with innovation and creativity, it's either the stuff you teach at business school and it's all about making a zillion dollars, which, okay, but, yeah. or it's, or it's new agey, you know, just think like this and you're going to levitate the Pentagon of which is, you know, I'm, I'm not that person. I, I wrote a book for the people. I, I come from a blue collar neighborhood. I came to college as a teamster. You know, I'm, I wrote the book for people who are trying to get a side hustle uh, you know, uh, make a little better life, figure out how to get their kid into a better school, take that recipe to a local, that, that's who I wrote the book for. I wrote the book for people who are trying to just make their life a little better and new. Yeah. And I, and I, I can really see that in the book and, and, um, and that, that, that really rang a chord to me. And I'm so glad that, um, <clears throat> that we got on each other's radars. I, I believe that I, you know, and, seen many other beautiful wisdoms though. I mean, in, in the book, you refer back to Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, and you you talk about, as a as Plato, not Socrates, uh, right? Plato, mm -hmm. and in and, and the book as well. And um, just some some old wisdoms, but how, how can we apply and, and get into a new way, bottom up, you know, to everybody? How can, how can you say, oh, you weren't born with the innovators or the creativity mindset? How, how can you get this, the six skills to, to get going? And what are some of the barriers? What are you going to run into? And, and, and as you're on this journey, what are you going to see? So I really, really like that. And thank you for answering the question because that ties so nicely into um, what's going on. And, and these governmental organizations, these bureaucratic monsters, they're just... Um, they've really failed us but then we're people where they have failed us all over the world not just the us and so i don't want to pick on anybody but then we've seen these clusters jump up of amazing people that they're faced with the problem they're faced with oh my god there's no more toilet paper or whatever it is and they get <laughs> so damn creative that they just solve it fix it and it's so successful i've just seen it time and time again and so uh, it's beautiful because uh, I really want to suggest that everybody jump out, uh, grab your book, watch those videos and do that. M my first real question for you is, do you consider yourself to be a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, division, walls, or this uh, separation of humanity one from another, whether it's culture or religion or, or just this, this Staunch nationalism that's come about. Well, when I was younger, I was a utopian, like a lot of people are when they're younger. <clears throat> um, I also, what's different in our generations, I'm considerably older than you, is um, I watched the abject failure of communism around the world, and I watched the hijacking of socialist systems, right? So, and it's not because the systems are bad, it's because power is power and people are people and nothing ever changes. I actually 
I actually am a big believer that we have some really good ideas that need to be um, updated. So um, I grew up also in a world of uh, the United Nations. I grew up in a world where people my generation, <clears throat> maybe a little older, think about like the Gates Foundation, et cetera, started becoming more universal travelers. So I don't think you have to give up your nation state view of the world. I'm not even sure you can, but I'm really big on uh, the whole idea is playing together. And I can tell you why, uh, why that's a challenge for everybody. And I write a lot about this. Um, we all have dominant logic. We have a thing that we believe, we have worldview, that we think this is the way the world works. And one of the easiest things that happens to us with politicians is when things go wrong, it's hard to explain complexities to, an, to the everyday person. So they blame the next guy down. They blame, you know, it's the other guy. So, so those guys who are next door to us. And if you're in Germany, you're seeing this right now. You know, if you're in Turkey, you're seeing it this morning with what's going on in the newspaper. You just go down the list here. And so you're seeing the rise of nationalism, I think, because of two things. One, because people are afraid <clears> that this is changing. And two, these explanations are easy. I, I, I have to go on record of saying I hate the idea of moving towards simplicity because I think simplicity is for simpletons. I think the world's complicated. I think the world is uh, filled with, with uh, nuances that need to be finessed and negotiated and worked through. But, I, but your, your, your inclination and ethos of why aren't we working together? Yes, <laughs> yes. Can I just say yes, yes, yes. And when did we all become, why do we hate each other because you go to this temple and these people go to that temple? Yeah, that's the, when I answer that, Mark, you will meet in Stockholm for the, for our exactly. Nobel dinner, right? Yeah, and, and it's really such a thing that, there's a couple reasons that I, that I mentioned it, and I, your answer is absolutely correct and so eloquent and beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. The, uh, there's obviously no right answer, um, but how you tie it to um, this beauty that, our world is so complex and it's made up of uh, very complex systems. And if we can get into this critical mindset, if we can get into uh, complexity science and system thinking and understand how um, instead, you know, instead of saying, give me the quick pitch, dumb it down, simplify it for me. I want the quick version elevator pitch or the Ted talk to, to, to solve this global grand challenge or this pandemic that we're dealing with. You know, let's let's break down. Uh, let's get into the complexity. Let's not dumb it down or simplify or oversimplify our life. The way eras and genres and the way we progress is by, by these I, I don't know I, I, these pinnacles of complexity or when we reach these plateaus of complexity, and that's that's how we thrive and and, and grow. And I think this time, although you you said it eloquently, is is is. We need to respect it. We need to take it serious. And it was a terrific time. It's also a time that we, we've really stretched our brains. We've stretched our, our hearts, our efforts, and, and kind of moved into this new way. Okay, we've got, we've got to think of a different model. Or we've got to think of a new model. Or we've got to take some old ones that have worked for a long time and, and, and make sure we, we can get that on a much global scale. Let, so let, me, we, let me build. Go ahead. Can I just build on something you're saying? Um, early in my career, I started looking at, now this is mostly for America, but it's true worldwide actually. But I started looking at the 21 places in America that produce almost all the intellectual property. It means it's overwhelming. I happen to live in this little town called Ann Arbor that uh, depending on what year it is, has more uh, venture capital per person than any city in this country, right? I live in a small town, yeah. right? But what's interesting is when we look at these 21 places, they're far more diverse than the adjacent areas. And in our country, it's because of immigration. We have a lot of immigrants. And you know the, the whole notion of, well, look at this year, we have six Nobel Prize winners in America, not one of them were born here, <laughs> right? So the notion is, this is our history. So we have this weird tension in our country, which is the places that make all the intellectual property and money are, look like the world, right? My wife is from, my wife is from Asia, Stanny's from uh, Indonesia, but she's ethnically Chinese. My grandparents were from Europe, right? 
uh, but I grew up in a Dutch on you know, this is Hungary, right? Yes, my, my grandfather was from Chopin, and my uh -huh. grandmother's father was from uh, Germany. Right. And um, so you grow up in these places where one day everyone acts one way, and then the next day there's hand waving people, and all, you know, the way we all grow up here. So, what's interesting to me worldwide, this is also true. When you start looking at the places that produce most of the intellectual property around the world, they're far more diverse than other places. So, the notion is it's not just nicety or getting along, although that's important. There's an ethical issue here, but it's also an economic issue. And that is these places are juggernauts because people don't agree. And when they don't agree, they have two choices. They can either try and shout at each other and destroy each other, or they can build hybrids. They can build better ways, third ways, new ways. And that's how the world advances. So to me, I'm very big on the notion that diversity is a requirement. So when you start looking at some of the European countries and some of the problems that they're having, it has a lot to do with these uh, different groups that don't want to, in any way to engage the other group. They just, they are launching their little wars and there's a lot of collateral damage. You can see what happened to France this morning, right? Um, but, the, and then you get America even more pronounced because it's obvious here. It's yeah, obvious what yeah. goes on here. So, the no, so I want to pick up on your notion of saying, it's not just the right way to be, it's also the only way if we're gonna go forward, you can't go backwards. I, I totally agree. I mean, there's so much we could dive into a couple of rabbit holes even there that we're we're, we're going in the right direction of, of, of what we're what we're trying to talk about as well. Um, the other reason I you know I mentioned this global global citizen or this this thought or process is because really our resources, water, air, species, um, the pandemic, uh, food, they're, they're all global citizens. They continued to move during a lockdown. They've continued to move, you know, across borders, nations and divisions. And um, the only thing that's been really domesticated is the human being, us, have been domesticated by food. And I mean, the food still, for the most part, grows outside. Um, but we're, we're locked up in these human zoos or these, these boxes now. Hopefully some of them are nice enough, but but during this lockdown period, we've really gotten this microscopic, this this zoom in view of of our human zoom. Some of us are like, what in the heck? I, I I could go and escape to work eight hours a day, or I could, you know, go. But now I'm, I'm kind of in this in this place, and you really quickly see, hey. I, I need to create a better zoo for myself. I need to create a better place of living and, and uh, because this is not working for me. And so we see this thing that kind of ties into much bigger pictures of, 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 of where I'm going as well. And so I'll yeah, let yeah, you touch on that. There, there's, there's two parts to this that are interesting. So the first part is a policy part and I'm not a policy guy. I'm a, I'm a university business school professor. Um, the policy part are, as you know, we've got a couple of wars in Africa and in uh, the Middle East that are all about the environment. They're all about rivers, what's happening upstream, why crops are dying downstream, the price of corn, all of uh, that. And, and, and that's, that's something that has to be addressed at the, the United Nations level. Are we gonna get along here? Otherwise we're gonna have wars <clears throat> and, and justifiable wars because somebody's basically stopping you um, Hold on here. Somebody's actually stopping you from. Um, somebody's actually stopping you from doing what um, <laughs> what you need to do, which is eat. the 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 second issue, um, which I like, what you're saying, I, I like it a lot, which is there's the issue of um, locality. So let me give you an example. There, when this whole thing happened, all these small restaurants in this country started going under. And the government came up with this big bill. And you know how this goes. All the fat cats figured out how to game the system. And out of a trillion five, a trillion two went to big companies, right? which, which was the exact opposite of what was supposed to happen. There's a city in Vermont called Battle, Battle Bureau. I'm, I'm going to say it again because I'm probably saying it wrong. Battle Bureau. So, and what they did was remarkable. They took the local restaurants and they redirected the government subsidies for underserved people. And they gave the money to these local restaurants as opposed to these huge multinationals. 
But the condition was these local restaurants had to buy their foodstuffs from local farmers, right? All of a the sudden, these people who would be eating kind of, you know, uh, institutional food are eating four, you know, I'm not probably five star because where we're at, maybe three star cuisine. And the local farmers are in business. The local restaurants are in business. Then the city of Newark started doing this. This is what I'm talking about when we start figuring out about food and, and the whole idea of our, what goes on in our bubble. I think, Mark, we're starting to realize that we live in communities again. I think we're starting to realize that the farmer down the road uh, you know, sells to the restaurant down the street, which is the place you eat at on Friday or your date night or whatever it is in your life. That's what I'm really liking. The policy stuff about, you know, the larger things, I, you know, uh, I'm hopeful, I'm, but I'm not, um, I don't want to be encouraging. I just don't see the winds blowing that way. I think it's just too easy to, to uh, rouse national sentiment and blame somebody else. I think yeah, locally is how this gets solved. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Thank you very much. Do you want to maybe touch a little bit more for us on can we can we give a teaser of uh, since you're already doing the videos a little bit more about the the six skills of creativity oh, yeah. these innovation process that, that for, for sure that, and and maybe I don't know if I give it make it even more complex for you because you you wanted you know you you have some ties to food in your in your past work and, and, and as well that that uh, you know is this big the big boys so to say that and how do you bring that down to these small communities how do you bring this in there if there's yeah. a way you could also tie that in you wanted to mention some yeah things as well yeah i'll come back to that so okay I, i'm sure mm -hmm. some some of your listeners will know i'm you know i've been involved in big energy and big food for a long time but you know, if you're gonna change the world, you have to go in the belly of the beast. Yeah. You can't do it by writing interesting op-ed pieces and sniping and b b doing a, you know, a company with eight people that's not gonna make any, that's not gonna move anything. You have to be willing to go in and see if you can fix some things. Um, but let me talk about the book. I think there's two things that I wanted to really emphasize in the book. So first of all, let me back up. I'm one of the old guys that, that, that really started this field in earnest it's really started in 1900 by a, a German professor named Max Wertheimer. And Wertheimer has two, uh, two very famous uh, students, one's named Kurt Lewin, who creates the organizational development movement, which incidentally where I met in Ann Arbor is also very big. The other is a man named Rudolf Arnheim. And Rudolf Arnheim is the founder of what we would call design thinking. He wrote a book in the 19, uh, early 1930s, late 1920s about art and perception. And he goes into this whole thing. He was my advisor. I'm his last graduate student. Wow, right? wonderful. Um, so I'm sort of the end of the start of the field. There's a guy who was in front of me at Stanford named Michael Ray. But I'm kind of the second guy in, the, in my world, in the business world that did this. So, you know, so I've had a, a, a ringside seat for a lot of the research. And the first thing I wanted to do was make the research fun and simple. I didn't like this study says this and this study says that. And so much that's written about being creative is just nonsense. You know what I mean? And so this is from some guy who's been in half the Fortune 500. As some of your listeners will know, I'm one of the guys that when I was very young helped build this $20 million company into Domino's Pizza. So those who are mad about fast food, I was very young. I just want to tell everybody, I was very young. Learned a lot. Um, I've had you know, tons of Domino's Pizza. So and, now my, my listeners are upset. I guess I got to shut it off now. I was, so, when I was younger, I, you know, I, I, I lived on Domino's Pizza. Well, we didn't know. We didn't. The good news is good things are happening at Domino's now, too. But it's yeah. been a while. But um, so, so, um, so, so I actually learned by doing a lot of this stuff. So the first thing I learned was mindset. And I translated a lot of these things into mindset. So let me just give you a couple of them that are really easy. First of all, uh, notice when and where you're creative. These are called flow states, right? Just notice when and where you're creative. And it's a simple thing. I'm a morning person. So in my house, I like to roll out about five in the morning, roll downstairs where I'm at my little studio. You know, and people go, how do you write? Well, I'm like, no one's up and no one's around, but my wife's a night hawk. So, you know, we, we've been married forever. <laughs> Right. So one of the things that we learned to do is she sleeps when I write and I sleep when she writes. 
but also uh, pay attention to, you know, are you creative when there's music on? Are you creative when it's quiet? Are you creative when you're running? Are you creative when you're meditating? When exactly are you creative? Here's why, Mark. It's not creativity on demand. It's creativity when creativity demands it. And I'm a total hypocrite. I'm a terrible hypocrite. Your, your listeners should know. I'm on airplanes all the time. I'm always saying I'm going to write on airplanes. I can't write on airplanes. And I always try. I always think. And then what happens is because I'm at deadline, I get up at five o'clock the next morning in the hotel, even though I'm giving a speech somewhere, talking to a board somewhere. <laughs> and, I, and I write. And you'd think at my age, I would begin to understand. I'd take my own medicine. But I just have to tell you, I don't. But, but I am trying to explain one of the things about a mindset is to know this is not the time that I'm creative. And I see people do this all the time. At two o'clock, we're going to be creative. I'm like, is the sugar you know, coma going to hit by two o'clock? <laughs> and they're not. So that'd be one. Other, other things I'm really big on are things like, um, let me give a couple more about mindset. Um, whenever I'm doing something really complicated and I can't figure out an answer, which is all the time, this whole mythology that, uh, that people like me come up with answers, that, uh, no, no. We have lots of dark nights of the soul. But one of the funny things is um, I grew up in the age of AM radio. So I'm, you know, I'm, um, I'm uh, 60, 61. And um, d b whenever I'm working on something, I can hear in the back of my head a song. And always, and then whenever that's happening to me, I call this consult the muse in your mind. So some people it's a feeling or a picture or a remembrance of something or an image is like, but there's always, and think about it, you know, you're, you've got something on your mind, you're checking, you're trying to leave the airport, you got to get your ticket and get out of the broad thing and drive home through the crazy traffic and all this complexity, but somehow that doesn't occur to you because you're really noodling on this, this thing. Well, if you're paying attention to that, almost inevitably, it's giving you clues. It's saying, and it does for me. But whenever I talk to people about this, I, this is because how funny, Mark, they lie. People lie. They say, no, no, I thought about this deeply. And I'm like, no, you went for a walk around the block and you looked at an oak tree and something happened and it triggered a thing. And all of a sudden you remembered this thing that happened in fourth grade and the synaptic connection was made and you had an answer. I'm like, that's how your brain works. Assimilation and accommodation. What happened was you were trying to find the pathway of those neurons to fire in that billion complex way. And you had a moment, a Satori moment, as they say in uh, in the east or you know or a moment of enlightenment or yeah. eureka as the greeks say so so that would be a second one saying are you paying attention to this dialogue between what we might call the intuitive part of your mind and, and you can't leave it there that's got it then it's got to talk to the rational part of your mind incidentally you should know that that uh, these functions are actually happening in very different pathways very different types of neural nets your brain is uh, very systematic this goes back to what I call cognitive inquiry strategy. Your brain has pathways that often don't cross. If they crossed, you'd, your life would be, well, we do know this. When they do cross, we have, this creates, uh, well, when people go, when people's neural nets begin to erode when they have dementia, they cross. And we have both cr uh, sort of real uh, delusion and, and we also have amazing sort of insights, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the final one, I, and there's, a, there's, a, there's eight of these. But the other one I would add is I'm very big that innovators look for incongruities. So this, we started with one of saying the government failed, but <laughs> these organic things worked. And I think most people don't look at that. They just say, well, the government failed. This is terrible. We're all going to die. I'm like, no, that, it doesn't work like that. These incongruities are like in our, my country, you know, everybody's mad at immigrants and trying to limit immigrants. And yet all the places that have money and the six Nobel prize winners are immigrants. So you're like, that's an incongruity. And why we need to look at that is anomalies and incongruities are where all the opportunities are. So I had a doctoral student come to me the other day. It's a great example. She was telling me about her research. And she's the first time she met me. And she's, being, she's very smart. She went to, you know, went to an Ivy League school. <clears throat> she started talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the reading she was doing at home about uh, personal issues, about development issues in relationships, like in marriages. And then she talked to me about what her work is at, you know, at this great, you know, I teach at one of the great universities of the world, right? <clears throat> um, and my thing to her was, how does the first thing relate to the second? And you could just see she was terrified. 
And I said, because you think they're incongruous. But I said, that's where the research needs to be, where nobody has research, where you're doing something that no one else is doing. That's how you advance the field, how you, um, uh, you make a name for yourself. That's a mindset issue. And I think she needed an older dog to kind of go, hey, you know, don't be afraid of that. So those are just three examples of kind of mindset issues that I think you have to get in off the bat before you can even start innovating. Well, don't, don't be afraid for <clears throat> being a, uh, an old fart because you're not. And I, I'm, I'm pretty old myself. I just turned 50 and I'm actually a grandpa. I just uh, got my fourth grandchild. My son's wife just had just had her daughter, uh, Soraya, a beautiful baby girl. And congratulations. Uh, yeah. And uh, I've got four adult children. And so it's, <clears throat> it's, um, it's a beautiful thing to, to grow old and have those wisdoms and experience it, but also to, to have the, the verb and vigor to keep going, keep thinking, keep, keep your mind alive and think about how can we, um, you know, have this creative mindset. How can we move forward with the, the new skills and and reinvent ourselves or or follow this great reset, as the World Economic Forum says, and and move forward. And I mean, I I like I mentioned, I I grew up with uh, you know Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, and and all the the good books that uh, that you've touched upon as well. But I want to make sure that I have those skill sets uh, for the future. Cause I'm always thinking of how can I create resilient, desirable futures? How can I innovate? And, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, I do, um, uh, I'm part of the expert network for the World Economic Forum and pre present innovations for purpose at Davos every year. And I, I like to uh, kind of stay in, not only in that creative process, but think how can, these, these microcosmic or these, these uh, uh, communities, these clusters um, present innovations or solutions that will solve our global grand challenges. And, and all, all that I've presented have always come from the bottom up, from someone who has said, I'm so frustrated with this system or I'm, I'm experiencing uh, you know, uh, cancer and I've lost my hair and I, I'm, that's a debilitating thing or I have breast cancer or I, I um, can't afford, you know, uh, I examine the, the glasses afterwards. How, how do we solve those problems? And then people get so creative that they solve the problem and they're, they're really, you know, not this really technological super uh, thing, but they're enough to really make a 250 million minimum impact on our world and, and, and things like that. That's really is what I like. Well, that, that's what that's, that's where people get lost. They, they get into either or thinking. <clears throat> um, this is this will be right in your wheelhouse, Mark. So a couple of years ago, uh, some Swiss scientists got together and said, you know, the, the way we're going to offset carbon is trees, right? This is the trillion tree argument, right? Which, which was very popular about a year ago before COVID. And so the notion is, you know, then we start thinking about drones and how do we, you know, plant, you know, I'm very familiar with all, all this because I get dragged into these things, right? But so that's important and we need to create resources for the trillion trees, but then governments don't need to do that because once you start looking at the data, all, all uh, uh, forests and all types of trees are very specific to the local uh, terroir, right? So what you really want to do then is give money and resources to responsible people who are local to solve the local problem. Because, because the one solution that you're going to have is kind of going back to the you know, Hoover Dam philosophy where we're going, to, we're going to ruin the environment even though we're trying to save it. You know, we, we had good intentions. Yeah, I want to tell young people who are listening, we had good intentions. <clears throat> There's two things that you know, we went to the moon. You know, we, we built the net, we, we did a pretty good job. We created a couple problems. We created a, a social injustice and inequities in the world. We didn't mean to, that was not our intent, right? And we ruined the environment. We did not intend to do that. <clears throat> so that, you know, the next generation, we need to make a more just world, right? And, and we need to fix the environment, but it's not gonna be fixed in the way that our fathers and mothers tried to fix it. It's gonna be fixed locally. 
but we have to create those world, eliminate those some of those boundaries and create some worldwide resources to do that. So, so it's not from above or below. It's that these things need to sync up. If this makes sense to you, Mark. <clears throat> so, in the book, I don't, I don't get into this in the book uh, per se. What I get into in the book is the six skills that you need to have. So let me let me unpack these because I think if you're trying to make your 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 community your own life better, you have to. These are this comes from years of being in the belly of the beast. I learned all of this the hard way. You know, being an innovator is not about throwing a punch; it's about taking a punch. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and and so for each of these skills, there's a number of methods that that you can use that are, and some of them are methods that you should know, and some are methods that maybe you don't know. But the first thing I call it create because I wanted to make sure this was a this was a you know this was a mnemonic device that was relatively easy to remember. So the first letter C is about clarify. Now I get <clears throat> I get very nasty reviews from students <laughs> because I make them spend half of the class trying to find what the right problem is. And the reason is all the research says in my work training for, for about a decade, I trained the uh, world's most prestigious consulting company in New York. Really smart people think they know the answer and they never do. They always get it wrong. And they think that the people who have the problem are just dumb. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> so the issue is what's the real problem, right? And finding that is hard to do. So there's a number, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. You have to walk down a lot of dead, dead ends. So you have to give yourself a lot of room for the first letter in our, in our little pseudonym, uh, create, which is to clarify. Tell me what's wrong. And we've all had the experience, haven't we, of working on a, working on a project to find out that we solved the wrong problem. I've, can I tell you a story, a quick story? Please. I worked on a project years ago. When I was really young, I was a member of an advisory group for Steve Jobs called AIS, Applied Integrated Systems. So it's, it sounds more he he heroic than it is. This is when he's being pushed out of Apple the first time. He's got a project in Los it Angeles. It was before General Magic. Yes, well, right, that's right. And the, a lot of the General Magic guys were people that, Yeah. Uh, if you know the history of this, particularly in the I university do. that I teach at, there's, there's a lot of connections there, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, so one of the projects was called the Xeno Project, and I worked on it with uh, Alan Kay, who developed the Macintosh. And uh, it was trying to create literacy in South Central Los Angeles. And it was doing it by teaching people these truck drivers in those old, old large laser discs. So people don't remember these, but the object was we were going to fool people because I think it was like 30, the Hudson Institute said like 30% of all graduates from Los Angeles school system were functionally illiterate. So the issue was we're going to teach them how to, we're gonna, sound familiar, we're going to teach them how to read, by teaching them how to get their S-class uh, truck driver's license because they're all going to be truck drivers. So we went through the whole thing, thought we were going to, thought technology is going to shrink the achievement gap, and it didn't make it smaller, it made it bigger. <laughs> so, so then, and incidentally, I have like 10 more stories, I guess. What about, about 10 years later, I got a call from the editor of Life magazine, and she was doing a report. Uh, they went out of business, I think, in 1990, and because they wanted to say who the 100 most important people were of the 20th century and she called me and I thought she wanted to talk about innovation. So I'm a brand new professor at this time. I just left Domino's, I'm in Michigan for my first year. I'm feeling, feeling pretty excited. She wants to talk about innovation. She wanted to talk to me about, by, about a guy named Robert Fair de Graff. My name's de Graff. Well, this was kind of weird. I'm like, my name's de Graff. And she's like, yeah, you, you idiot. They told, you're related to him. Well, true story. My father didn't get along with his father. I don't know anything about my father's family. Well, it turns out I had a great uncle who was this guy. He's the inventor of paperback books, created this company called Pocket, Pocket Books. And, he, and there was a biography written about him called Two-Bit Culture. And what he thought was, the reason he did it, is he thought if you could buy a book for 25 cents in a train station, illiterate people would become literate. And I read this and I thought I made the exact same mistake. So the mistake I made and the mistake he made was a clarifying problem. We went to the solution before we understood what the real issue was. There were no jobs to be had for truck drivers in South Central, <clears throat> um, in South Central Los Angeles. There's no reason for a late day laborer in the 1920s during the Depression to become literate. <laughs> I'm just looking at this going, and we're doing it again. You know, if they only have a, a, a touch screen, uh, the Kalamazoo Promise. You know, if everybody goes to college for free, it'll solve the problem. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. So first, clarify. Two, replicate. Replicate is, uh, Aristotle writes about it, called mimesis, right? Uh, mimicking. Um, 
you know, uh, Chaldean crows do it, <laughs> octopi do it. <laughs> you know, humans are not the only creative things, but we certainly can learn by copying nature, what's called biomimicry. You know, the flukes of a whale become the rudder on a sub. You know, the peregrine falcon's wings become a fighter jet's, you know, design and so on and so forth. And this, there's a lot that can be done there. The, the third letter E, elaborate, comes to us actually from uh, a very controversial man who wrote one of the most famous books of the 20th century, Arthur Kessler, who wrote Darkness at Noon, also was a famous psychologist and also had a really interesting life. You can, your listeners can look into this. He kind of went to pieces at the end of his life. But he coins this term called bisociation. And what he means is whenever you're approached with something that doesn't normally go with something else, your brain naturally assimilates it. Um, this is sometimes called defamiliarization if you're an artist. It means I'm trying to confuse the brain. And that's all brainstorming is. Brainstorming is taking things that don't normally go together and making synaptic connections. And there's a structured way to do this. A lot of brainstorming is useless. And there are, there, in the book, there's some instructions about how to actually do this in the right way. So those are the first three letters. I'll stop at the first three. Clarify, replicate, elaborate. And for each of these, there are tools or methods of saying, here's, you know, and I didn't write in here, here's what we did at Apple or here's what we did at Google. What I wrote in here was, here's what you can do. And if you want to make that thing in your garage work, you might want to think about this. And here's a little story about somebody who did it. That's so beautiful. <laughs> exactly. And we'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of give a little bit of teasers in the show notes and description and obviously put your links in where they can uh, go and look at the videos as well. There are six and they're just fabulous one after the other with uh, uh, the, the, the acronym, um, you know, create, create basically. And, and so it's, it's, it's beautiful how, how, how you pull that out. And um, I, I, you know, I, I have to uh, be honest, I, I, I've been stalking you, I've been following you for a while, I've read your books, you know, and I, I, and I know enough to be dangerous, but I also like the, your way of thinking. I've watched your PBS uh, stuff and, you know, um, I'm a big PBS and, and uh, an NPR uh, listener, or used to be, I'm now, I've, the last 10 years I've been living in Hamburg, Germany, and so not as much as, as before, but that's how, it, that's what I grew up on. And um, those are organizations were, were um, great thinkers, great people that come to, to depart wisdom at, at a different, different level. And so I really, um, <clears throat> well, I want to thank you, but I'm so honored to have you on the show and, and to talk to you about these, these things. The, the, thing that I really kind of want to unpack and, and, and go into before I get to my first really um, big question is, as you go through these processes and these skills and, and, and um, talking how, how we can create these clusters or how from the bottom up that, you know, anybody can kind of take this journey and, and, and um, you know, learn through the stories to, to, to get that success. By the way, the the the, uh, the second one with the, the mimicry is one that I use all the time because I do a lot with with food, and so I truly believe that I see that in, in other things around innovation that I present and that I work on as well. Um, I'm a little a little I guess I have a bias, and that is how can we do creativity or innovations, impactful innovations for purpose that solve global grand challenges. And um, <clears throat> you, in your book, you talk a lot about uh, you and uh, Stanny both uh, because she's the co-author so uh, as well, but you talk about creating the environment. And when you use terms like resilience or sustainable uh, in the book, it's more about environment or is it sustainable more in, a, in, in an emotional or mental way instead of the, the environment? Uh, I, mean it or, I mean, I mean it both ways. Um, th that's yeah. a great, incidentally, it's great where you're going with this. Yeah. Um, let me speak th to this. Go there's, ahead, please. There's, I've, I've worked on a number of projects that if you're, if you're really an eco warrior, because I get letters from you guys all the time, yeah. I'm, I'm an innovation guy and I care about the environment, but I don't think of myself as an eco-wear. I also work on medicine and everything yeah, else. Yeah. 
So I worked on um, I worked on Eco Imagination, which was the first fifteen billion dollar spend. I worked on if you're familiar with energy transmission, if you're familiar with bat, I've worked on all that stuff. <clears throat> um, there, here's the point that I would make. Um, the <clears throat> whenever you think about being creative, I want you to think about three phases to being creative. The first phase is design or design thinking phase. Lots of variations, version one, version two, version three, lots of creativity, all good. But that, if that remains your phase, which is what happens with smaller companies, you'll never get to scale. You'll never get to the moon, right? I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. In order to do that, you have to get all the way to the aft position, which is optimization, which is how do we do this? So think about, I want you to think about something that's really controversial. So am I allowed to be controversial here? Please, of course. Think about one of the big issues is GMOs, yeah. right? GMOs. So there's all this talk from all the anti-GMO people about GMOs, but there's two or three very large credible studies at places like Purdue, ag schools that basically say, if you do that, you'll actually ruin the environment because so much more of the environment will have to be, uh, you know, arrogant, you know, irrigated and so on and so forth. And oh, by the way, you're gonna starve these people in the meantime. And so it's, there's people are yelling across the fence, but the truth of the matter is um, the eco movement's getting a lot of traction at the small level, at the community level. But the notion is once you start looking globally, right? And you start looking at the big monstrous com companies, this is gonna be a problem. So, so the answer becomes kind of understanding the phases of innovation. So the first phase where we're doing a lot of that kind of stuff that you're seeing in, in your space, which is tremendous. And I wanna be really supportive of that. <clears throat> but then you're also seeing the aft position. And if, if we're gonna get off of these, you know, the, the, these few companies that are doing all this, we're gonna to have to figure out something that's going to replace them at scale, which is not gonna be everybody doing their own thing. It's going to be picking, and it doesn't mean everybody does one thing, but it's just like any, you know, it's like it is now. There's going to be like 10 variations around the world, depending on where you're at. And that's going to be scalable. So I want everybody to remember this word that goes with sustainability, scalable. It has to be scalable, right? So the notion is Elon Musk comes up with an interesting idea. He's got 90% failure rate with his car, right? And only, this year, he's going to see, last year he sold 365,000 cars, which was his target for 2015. So he's five years behind, right? Or four years behind. But, but what he's getting at is he's getting at scale. And the process between that interesting design that had a 90% failure rate and where he's going now is what's, what, what we're talking about with the environment. That's what I want you to see. The failure cycle in between and all the rough water in between. So that middle part, right? That middle part before we get from diversification to optimization is the part that we have to walk through. And it's really contentious and it's terrible, right? But but if we're going to go from being a, if we're going to go, incidentally, a lot of this, you're going to get hate letters or I'm going to get them. No, no, no. Uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> a lot of this movement reminds me when I grew up, uh, I grew up in a very progressive family and we used to go out and um, we used to do some things. We used to do some things with these, um, with the migrant community, trying to help migrant community. And what we would run into is a lot of these kind of organic farmers, communes, people in communes. And they were great ideas, but they could never get to scale. They weren't sustainable because they couldn't figure out how on a daily basis. And some of them did, you know, think about, you know, red mill oats and all that kind of stuff. Some of them yeah. figured it out, but most of them didn't. Quaker so, was actually, um, you know, a commune type of an organization at first. That's, so. They're friends. They were, they were, yeah. remember Quakers are what's called yeah. friends, the yeah. friends community, yeah. right? Yeah, you're right. Um, so, so the notes, yes, that's, that's a perfect way of putting it. So I want your listeners to be utopian. I want your listeners to do small things, but I want them to understand that there's going to come a point in order to sustain this, they are going to have to get to scale. And to get to scale, you have to think about more difficult things. I'm going to tell a real quick story. I worked on a project. Oh, I want to hear it. Yeah. Worked on a project for a radical different kind of a jet, small jet, family could, uh, six people could go on the jet. It was made of uh, hybrid materials and something they had before graphene. It was lighter, used way less fuel. It was very, very environmental, right? And the notion was they thought everybody buy this jet. Now a jet, 
a, like a real nice jet, it's like like eight million dollars. This jet, I think, was like a couple million dollars. So it was like this huge price point, and everyone was like, and "We're all going to be driving jets." So the first time I got involved in this, I laughed, and I said, um, "Well, did you go look at Henry Ford?" And they said, "What?" And I said, "Henry Ford, 1938, 1939. Henry Ford developed a small plane that everybody's going to drive. We're all going to fly a plane to work." And suddenly, that's why we were able to build bombers during the Second World War so quickly at the Ford plants in the north because Henry Ford had really thought this through. I'm like, but it didn't work for all the obvious reasons because you have to have air traffic control. People have to fly these things. You have to gas these things up. You know, how are you going to manage? Uh, how are you going to manage that you need uh, five thousand more airports? And the notion was, <clears throat> um, the great news was they made this great little jet. The bad news is to get to scale and sustainability, a whole lot of other things have to happen, which are much heavier lifting, require large sources of revenue and income to decide to do things. So my concern about all this is this grassroots effort off, often wants things that are look more like what they, where, what they are now, not what they need to be to be sustainable. And so we get really bad policies. We get, you know, we get trains that are supposed to run from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And you could just see when they did this, I don't know if you're familiar with this project, you could just see it's going to be a debacle, right? And, and, and I understand why they want it, because we want mass transit, we want people, to, but the notion is that's taking this small idea and not translating it into what it would need to be to be a big idea. Is this making sense to you? Is it's sense? totally making sense. And, and But it also goes back to how we started where we talked about complexity and systems and how they really all, we can't just address a couple of facets. We've got to really, to scale, you've got to have all the, the facets of there. And two examples that you also brought up, uh, Elon, whether it's Tesla, SpaceX, whether it's Solar City. All those are overarching infrastructures to connect. And if he doesn't have that infrastructure, he's made the partnerships with Panasonic or whoever else to fill in the gaps of those other uh, facets of that, that bigger complex system. You get it. And I want to add to that. And things don't mm -hmm. happen overnight. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't. Electric cars, electric cars when they started versus hybrids. And you should know this, look this up. Even to this day, I think hybrids are 14 times more um, energy efficient or, or environmentally efficient. But that won't be true forever. So when you start, why? Why would I say that? Because in this country, when electric cars started becoming big, incidentally, it didn't start with, with Tesla. It actually started with the EV1. It started General Motors. They buried yeah. them in the desert in 91, 92, right? But yeah. the notion is uh, when this started, 40% uh, of all, utilities uh, were coal fire, right? And they've, so even though you're driving an electric car, you're really polluting the environment because the electricity was generated through coal fire. But one of the more worst things you could do, all the sulfur dioxide in the environment. Now it's in this country, it's about 25% and rapidly decreasing because it's going to natural gas, but natural, people get mad about natural gas, but natural gas, far more uh, energy efficient, far more uh, better for the environment, but again, not perfect. So what's happening is the electric car preceded the utility company. And eventually the utility company will have <clears throat> a very small uh, coal footprint. And the electric car will be a better idea than the hybrid, but right now not. Incidentally, when you start looking at what is the most efficient way to, to, uh, to move, and there's something called torque, which means how heavy things are. It's actually, it's actually people will laugh, it's combustion engines. But, but combustion engines can be built in highly efficient ways. And they can run on things like, uh, you know, combustion engines can combust salt water, <laughs> all kinds of things. So, so the notion is, we think innovation's a straight line to sustainability. It's not. It's evolutionary. We're going to have to go through some things, and you can't just flip the switch. We saw Germany try and do this with the with the with the green meter stuff that you guys did. We saw. California do this, and then Pacific Gas and Electric had all those rolling out, you know, outages, and now they're burning things down. So the notion is, you got to take it step by step, and that I think is something people don't like to hear. They want everything now. There, I mean, since you brought it up, I, I'd like to, if if you don't mind, tell tell a story as well. So, have you ever heard the the story of three Henrys? No. So there's uh, Henry Berg, Henry Ferguson, and Henry Ford. Uh, and they're 
almost all at the same time. So Henry Berg was uh, 1813 to 1888. Henry, Henry Ferguson was 1884 to 1960. And Henry Ford was 1863 to, to 1947. And uh, wh what we need to know is this, the story of the three Henrys. They, they all uh, drastically change uh, the future. So um, uh, I'll start with Henry Berg. So Henry Berg uh, was really about animal cruelty, he says these horse, these cattle are uh, working all these hours a day, they're dying in the roads, they're not being fed properly, they're not being rested, um, uh, they're, you know, manure or crap all over the roads, there's all sorts of ex uh, uh, other problems created, but the, the uh, so he created this uh, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, right? Um, and then Henry Ferguson, he really, you know, Massey Ferguson, if, you've, if you know anything about uh, farming, so he created, as a British mechanic and inventor, he developed agriculture tractor, the first agriculture tractor, and actually him and Henry Ford um, were seeing the many pictures together, you know, uh, on the tractors and, and how, how they could do it. Um, and then Henry Ford, obviously, he, he didn't develop the car. He developed the manufacturing process, the production on how we can do it, the, the complexity that we're talking about, that system of how you can produce efficiently. And so if you were to be able to, to put yourself in, in the mindset of a horse or a cow, uh, which one of these three men, these three Henrys did the most for you? You know, um, boy, the animal cruelty, that, that was great. I also love what you're saying, and, and it relates to what we need to do and your listeners need to do. You need to start locally and figure out what you can do with what you have now. The old Teddy Roosevelt saying, you know, don't get stuck in the planning cycle and don't wait for other people. Start innovating today. That's the democratization innovation. That's what I'm all about. My innovation labs, the innovate rooms are all about this. <clears throat> Let's start today. But understand this. So Ford uh, grows up in the, you know, the Edison Turbine Company. You know, he said he actually knows Thomas Edison. He's also from Michigan, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he goes out on his own, creates his production system, creates this real interesting car. But he's got a huge problem. He's got two problems. The first problem is there's nothing that can fuel him. Sound familiar, Elon Musk? Yeah. So he makes yeah. a deal with the devil. He makes a deal with the John Rockefeller, right? That's yeah. a, if yeah. ever there was a deal with the devil, that's a deal with the devil. And they could use good standard oil of Ohio fuel. And, but then the second problem is there's no roads. Well, John Rockefeller at the time is the wealthiest man in the world, has a bunch of congressmen in this pocket, and he basically leans on these congressmen and they build roads. Now, some of your listeners are going to go, but that's where we all went wrong. It's the worst thing that ever happened. Well, you know, in America, that's kind of how we do things. Um, no, well, no, no, no. And, and, but, but the, yeah, but the other ahead. side of it is, in order to get this done, you, you can't just yell across the fence at everybody. We're going to have to use a lot of playbooks and a lot of people that maybe. So with somebody, when Eco Imagination started, I had a Belgian woman come up afterwards. And she, when she figured out I was one of the architects of this, and she said, how do you feel about General Electric making you know, this amount of money when they made that amount of money ruining the environment? And I remember saying to her, I, I said, how I feel is that's how it works. Do you want to clean up the environment? She said, yeah. And I said, well, then you need somebody with that scope and scale to start, start the ball rolling. Now, again, they had their own problems, but they certainly were responsible for getting this to start rolling, whether you like them or don't like them. Right. And that's what I'm trying to get people to get to is we're going, it's going to take all of us and it's going to take a whole bunch of different views of the world. And it's going to take some pushing and shoving. And that middle part, which we're in right now is going to feel like hell it does but we have to keep going forward. It's the only way to go. It's like COVID. It's the only way to go. We got to go forward. Uh, I still haven't even gotten to my first most uh, uh, hardest question for you, but I want to, fi to finish explaining um, the three Henrys because- Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt I'm, you. You're, you're fine. I'm not sure if you or my listeners understand the importance of it. So it's not really that the animal cruelty who did the most for horses it's not the tractor that did the most for horses and cows um and it's really not even henry ford 
but he, I think the, the thanks would be to the most part to Henry Ford for his production and manufacturing system um, that that helped those animals help that to leave that but there's one step further than that and it has to do with the complexity that we talk, we spoke about and and the innovation for the future of anything sustainability resilience or the future of any product any food product any uh, new smartphone any new uh, flying machine or or air taxi it's not about the brand, the brand or that future product's name or cool innovation, it's about how we produce those products of the future that will ease the suffering of humanity and ease the problems and destruction on our environment, on our, on our climate, on our biodiversity. So um, that's why I like innovators like Elon Musk, I like innovators like Henry Ford, I like um, thought leaders who are thinking of ways and creating almost these planetary services. They're saying, how can we use first principles thinking? How can we use a creative mindset to clean up and solve these problems um, and do it in a, in a production way? It's how we produce that in that process, doesn't first have to harm human health or environment in that process. And that's a whole different mind, mindset of shift. The vital part of it is, is the scale, which you've been talking about is how do we get that type of thinking to scale? Right now, there's ton, tons of planetary services uh, companies popping up. Climeworks is dealing with the scale issue and they're just starting to get the ball rolling. Um, there's, you know, the uh, uh, Slate Boylant who's doing the, the riverways and ocean cleanups with the ocean cleanup projects. And, and that's now getting to scale. And there's many others on board coming online, um, especially in the energy sector, uh, food sector as well. There's a lot, a lot of, of new startups, new innovators that are getting ready uh, and already eating the lunch of some of these big players out there. Yeah, let me give let me give you two, <clears throat> if I might, let me give you two <clears throat> examples of this. So one, people get the system wrong. So people, the big thing right now is plastic bottles. They're ruining everything. Well, you know, Coca-Cola had a plan for plastic bottles going back to the nineties, making them out of plants. The problem isn't that they can't make a bottle out of plant or the cost. It's not the problem. This is a classic example of clarify. The problem is shelf life. The problem is in the distribution of Coca-Cola, that bottle of Coke may sit on, the, <laughs> sit on a, a sh store shelf at a bodega somewhere for a year. And that bottle starts to break down in six months or seven months. The second problem is the business model of that, which is the bottling company is not the parent company that sells the syrup, right? So one company has an interest in doing that. Another company has, uh, there's a detriment. So the problem isn't, can't, can we make this and is it affordable? This is your systematic thing. The second thing, when you've got a long-term cause and effect problem, the, the sad part is nobody cares about your stupid innovation. They care about how it solves their problem, right? That's what they care about. So nobody cared about climate change until the entire West Coast of this country is on fire. The Great Lakes are as high as they've been in 700 years. All of our rivers are burgeoning. And if you know anything about the United States, we have more rivers than the rest of the world combined, right? We have a huge river system in this country. Uh, it's part of the reason we got to be able to move around and stuff. And there, what are there? In, uh, in late October, there are five hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean, right? So the notion is, this is all of the sudden, this is becoming real, not because people have changed their mind about the theory or the policy, it's becoming real because their house is burning or it's underwater or something terrible is happening. And I'd love to say that people change before events, but you know, and I know they don't. A lot of innovation is event driven. Did we know there could be pandemics worldwide? We did. <clears throat> in fact, the Gates Foundation started talking about this in the early nineties. And so did, the, so did the World Health Organization. And when has there ever been a time, Mark, in this world where we didn't have pandemics, right? Herodotus writes about it, right? The, the, the Chinese, the, Confucius writes about it in the Analects, right? So the notion is these are old ideas, but the notion is nobody pays attention to any of this crap. 
until it's a crisis. And here's what the one thing you're seeing shifting. Again, this is, comes back to my book, The Anomalies. One of the things you're seeing shifting is everything was optimized in our life. Everything optimized. The optimal thing until the optimization when you realize that everything is aligned when something was a dislocating event, everything becomes dislocated. So now you can't go to school, you can't go to the football game, you can't go to the restaurant, you can't do this. You can't do any of those things that were all optimized. Toilet paper, there wasn't enough. Hand sanitizers. Can you believe in the United States we could not get <clears throat> protective equipment and we have, it'll be a scandal forever and rightfully so that we've killed our frontline workers, which has been an absolute disaster. So the notion is we're starting to figure out diversity and we're, ha we're having the wrong conversation. The right conversation, the, the conversation we're having is it's all about China. Well, the truth is it's all about, you need multiple sources and multiple ways. And, <clears throat> and, and what people are saying is, but if that happens, it'll cost more. Well, if we're being innovative, first of all, it'll cost a little more, not a lot more if we're being innovative, right? If we're being truly innovative about how we manage these systems. But really what that requires is these different groups of people with very different ideologies and very different views of the world actually start talking to each other. That's what's got to happen. So I wanted, I just wanted to build your point about systems oh, of saying I, people no, get I the totally system agree. wrong. They think this is the problem. It's not the problem. The problem are these other things downstream. What If you solve those, then all of a sudden we have a plant-based bottle. All of a sudden the bottle not only is good when it goes to the Atlantic Ocean and <laughs> turtles eat it, it's good for them, you know. I, but right I would now, really hope that we could solve these problems, that we could really get there, but we're going to go down so many rabbit holes and open this up that, uh, you know, because we, we've touched, uh, and I, I truly believe that the, the, the local, the indigenous, the clusters, the communities, that they're really the front line, they're the bottom up, they're, they're the, yep. the key to a lot of solutions. But then what, what we hear, and you just touched upon it, okay, China's to blame, right? They're, they're to blame, That's, it's their problem, whatever. Well, if we had that approach, and if we're being so nationalistic, it shouldn't even come into our radar. It should have no effect what, what China or Brazil or whoever is doing, because we're not getting any of our resources there. They're not producing any of our products there because we're local, we're resourceful. We're being innovative and creative in our own nation. The thing is, is we, the, the U.S., and I'm from the U.S., um, uh, may have the, the, the Nobel laureates and may have those great people, then, then let's get creating. Let's make America great again. Let's get that creativity and, 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 uh, uh, and that creating out of that stuff, not just on one little fringe on the side. And so that's, that's what this that's, book is about. That's where your bu book is about. Exactly. That's why we're having this discussion. And so, but we need to enlighten people. We need to talk about that and say, I understand that's what's being discussed in the book. That's what, what's, what's happening to, to help people with that knowledge to make that shift. So before we get on any more rabbit holes because we, I mean, we could tell stories for hours. Uh, uh, we, we've been around for a while and um, have, have had some great experiences. You, many more than I, I could probably ask you on, on, on some of the greats that you've known and met over the years or consulted with um, to give us some more wisdom and how we can apply that to what, uh, what's going on today and how we can move forward in the future. And those things will be found in your book. But my first big question for you um, is the burning question, WTF, and that's what we've been asking ourselves this year many times, uh, uh, but it's not the swear word. Uh, it's what's the future? Yeah, um, I think we're, at, we're all at one of those um, inflection points. Um, there are three futures and I'm, I, I want to be optimistic. I'm not sure I am. It's going to take, if you talk to me in a couple months, coming into this year, I told all my staff, I said, um, in the head before the virus really, I said, this is going to be a bad year. This is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of pandering to ideologies that are outdated and don't work. And if you think about almost all the elections around the country, and let's not just talk about the United States, and let's not just talk about politics, because politics are usually a reflection of culture and what goes on. So it's not just the candidates, it's the, it's the culture. There's one part of the culture around the world that says uh, all of our problems are created by people who aren't like us. Think about England, think about Brazil, think about India, think about the United States, right? We're all doing it. <clears throat> um, then there's another culture that says, burn the system down. Uh, we're going to do something completely different. Think about the way it, the election could have gone here. Think about the election that you tried to have in the United Kingdom, right? <laughs> I don't want to get a, I don't want to get everybody's ire up, but I just want you to get that on a bell curve, the edges of the bell curve are masquerading as the middle. Because both of these groups represent a very small percentage of the populations in these countries, but they're very vocal and they're very dangerous. <clears throat> they're they're not savvy. They have weapons. Both sides. It's gonna. And I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say they're equal, but I'm just saying the edges of the bell curve are masquerading as the middle. And the reason they are, is because enormous inequities have been created around the world. Enormous, right? And that was a side effect of high efficiency capitalism. So one group wants to get rid of capitalism and the other group wants to double down and say, you know, make something yourself, right? So the, so the first thing is, um, the first scenario is that the middle of the bell curve strikes back. And you're seeing that in my country. You're seeing the middle of the bell curve start to roar back. Whether it will roar back big enough next week, we'll have to figure that out. <laughs> um, think about the candidate, the centrist candidates Right. So in the midterms, it was all uh, everything moved to the left um, in, the, you know, if you know this. And for the first time in uh, my lifetime, the generation behind me voted more than my generation did because I'm from a baby boomer with largest generation. First time Xers and millennials, your generation showed up. Right. Actually showed up. Um, and, and so so the the first scenario is the middle shows up and things in an evolute and speed and magnitude are always the big issues. How much, how fast things slowly start to get better. We start to walk this back. Um, hope, I hope for that scenario. Second scenario, and you're seeing this in other parts of the world is as far as the right moves in countries, the response will be the left will move that far. It's uh, Newton's law, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that those groups, um, become like in my lifetime become like the soviet union they become ideological but certainly unsustainable they try and create all these new utopian systems that don't work out they destroy the old system so there's no place for the new system to go um i hope that doesn't happen we've seen that happen in a couple of countries around the world already that's not a very good thing to happen so is as much as we're concerned about the one system being uh, trying to go backwards, we got another system that maybe is trying to go forward too fast and too much. I think the third scenario, which is an interesting one, which is the one that I actually think is probably going to happen, Mark. I, I'm going to say something really radical, and that is, what if politics don't matter anymore? What if it completely doesn't matter? Because if you start looking at who funds our municipalities, it's all now these private industries. And what if the political entities that we've all thought were, have, were so powerful, what if they have no power at all? What if we disregard them? What if, what if, um, what if, things, are, what if things happen through different avenues? And I think to a large degree, that's happened in my country. Whether it's, and I'm not saying it's all good, but I'm just saying, if you were to say which is more powerful right now in the United States, the Senate or Google, you know, because the Senate's now got Google on uh, mad on this. I'm like, yeah. if this was a if this was a bar fight, you know, I got ten bucks on Google, you know, the Google is going to wipe the floor with these guys. So to me, and I'm not, and I'm not, do, do not want your listeners saying Jeff is in favor of big corporate interests. I am not, right? What I am trying to say is. The, uh, it, that big interest could be a could be a union, could be cooperative, could be uh, you know a community, and I think they're starting to be. And I think the biggest thing that the young people have got right is that they get that as a consumer they can direct these companies by their buying habits, 
what they get wrong is they're all over the place. So if you didn't like candidate A, you know what, they, what they'll say is we're going to boycott these 1500 places. That's, a, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If you don't like candidate A, you figure out who are the three people that sit at the top of these committees and what's the one company that supports all of them and you basically destroy them, right? I mean, I'm not trying to give you a blueprint for this, but what'll happen is those people will capitulate because they have to capitulate to money. So the notion is there's, there's, this, there's this reckoning about, about uh, inequity that we're going to have to deal with one way or the other. Um, I'd like it to be scenario one. <laughs> um, scenario three looks very much like it's happening. And scenario two, um, I think is incredibly viable in the next five years because we're no longer on the sunny side of the hill. And you're, when you're very correct on on how you how you give your answer, so you're giving us three choices, and uh, you're you're covering all, all the demogra uh, demographics, but that's okay. I'm going to put you on the spot, though, Jeff. I'm going to put you on the spot, and I, I, I want to ask you. It's a very similar question. Uh, but it's it's you. It's your answer. It's for you, and maybe uh, no more extended than for your family, uh, for Stanny and your kids. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Yeah, I'm. Um, this is where I'm going to go. Absolutely back to my upbringing. I think there's two things that need to happen. Number one. It's again, this is going to upset some of your readers. It's not where we all end. It's where we all start. Right. The, the whole notion of equality and liberty are not the same idea. Liberty is about freedom. Quality is about sameness. So to me, the only way to have a just society is to start everybody at the same place. And that means there's a lot of issues about injustice that are legacy issues around the world. Education systems are an absolute disaster, not just in this country, in a lot of countries. <clears throat> um, you know, um, some people need childcare because they're, you know, we, so the notion is, I don't think we've done a very good job. It, it, what I think in my world, we do a much better job at the starting line. All the way through, I think in America, one of the things that'd be very easy to do is make community colleges for free. So even if you have a trade, you, you have skill, right? And I think you should be also given opportunities to gain capital early in your career so you can build businesses. It's good for the economy, you become a taxpayer, it's all good. The second thing that uh, I think needs to happen is we need to have a, a vision or a sense of destiny, and we don't. When I grew up, we were going to the moon. It was pretty clear. The uh, Soviets had Sputnik in space. And so all of us good little, good little boys and girls when I grew up in America, we all, you know, we, we look at it. We were the envy of the world in terms of science and math and things like that. I grew up with that. Um, what happens once you become sort of the big dog on the street, your, your goal becomes staying the big dog, which is not a goal, right? Your goal should be, um, we're going to fix the environment. And in fact, incidentally, one thing that I, I come back to the COVID thing, the world I want, I'm delighted that, that, uh, not entirely America, I don't want to make it sound like that, but mostly America is solving this problem, right? We're solving with the vaccine, we're solving that problem. Look at the money that's being spent in this country versus being spent in other countries. I'm not trying to make an America first argument, not at all. I'm just saying that we're doing what needs to be done in spite of everything else. And I think that's given us a sense of destiny. That's, that's where, where I'm from, we shine. Like we're gonna do this and going to Mars is not that. I think the, the two things that we have to go to the moon on are we, we created a very unjust world. All you have to do is drive 50 miles in either direction from where I live in Ann Arbor. I live in a bubble where everyone is smart and whatever and drive 50 miles in any direction. I'm, and I'm from one of those places. And then the second, the second part about uh, that is the environment, which is your passion. I think we've ruined it. And, but the other side of it is this is where, this is where I'm a boomer. I'm not about uh, living in small houses. If you want to live in a small house, that's cool, right? If you want to recycle bananas, that's cool, right? I'm in favor of all that. 
But I think the way you solve the environment is that uh, that combustion engine gets 300 miles to the gallon, right? And uh, you know those those areas that currently burnt down. Instead of us trying to do everything with that, why don't we make those places picket fence around them and say let's let them recover? Let's let's say we don't build on any. Let's decide like we did with the national parks. We're not. So a lot of it's uh, not what I think we should do. It's what I think we should stop. Some of it's what we should start doing, and some of it we should stop doing. And what you know, here's the big problem with all this on a personal level. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to human nature. Really I hate does. to say it. I hate to say, you know, um, how many do you have friends uh, that are social media friends that have posted things that were they're nice people. You went to school with them. You like them. I want to start out by saying they're good people, but they have bad ideas. And you've tried to explain what's wrong with their idea. Instead of listening, what do they do? They get more enraged. This is dominant logic, right? This is what this is the world we're in. And what we keep trying to do is we keep trying to explain logically how this works. What we need to do is make this personal and more emotive, right? Think about you have grandchildren. I just got my first grandchild a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, saw, I saw it online too. Yeah. Wonderful. The big thing is, do you want to have a better world for your grandchildren? Make it personal. So yes, the, the world I see, I don't like, I like the cho I like that we have a centrist choice that we can that we can take the system that we've got and and re-level set it to what it was originally supposed to do, which was everyone started at the same place, like when I was a boy. Well, that incidentally isn't true across the board. So, you know, strike that. It should have been it should have been more inclusive, but if it, if what I went through was more inclusive, it would have been better. And then two, um, where are we going as a planet? You know, uh, and I just I don't see it. I don't see it in Germany. You know, uh, you have this incredible you know Mrs. Merkel, and where she you know she's stepping. Where are you going? I know what you don't want. I don't know what you want. And same is same is true for us. The only country that seems to have a pretty clear idea where it's going right now happens to be China. And, and it's uh, where it's going is uh, uh, scary. Looking at the road they're building, et cetera. Multi-generational views or this, this infinite game, as uh, Simon Sinek would say, uh, you, you've unpacked a couple of things. I can only get into a, a couple of them just a little bit to tickle the fringes. And then, then we've got to wrap up with a couple of questions. Um, I really appreciate your views and, and you unpacking, you know, what's the future and what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? There are some, some things that I've really heard out uh, and also experienced. A lot of us are waiting uh, for the future to be delivered to us. So we're hoping that through a vote or something that there's a politician or someone looking out for our infrastructure and our best needs and that they're going to deliver us that since we voted or since they're the ones who are in the political power or in the government or um, that they're going to deliver us this future and we're kind of waiting for it that well that's uh, we're really going to be disappointed if we wait for the future to be delivered to us that's something that we yes. you know i always stand behind a map or and i'm show you show the earth a lot is because we're all uh, on the same planet, but we're all crew members. There's none of us who are passengers just along for the ride waiting for uh, the, the, these wonderful pol politicians that we have to, to create this beautiful future to deliver it to us. Even, even the innovators that is kind of in our arena, um, we're gonna be sorely disappointed. Let's put our hand on the steering wheel. We can actually play a big role on, on what our futures look like uh, and our families and the way we live. Uh, the thing that you did mention with with the moonshots, you talked about GFK's moonshot. I'm also a big fan, and I love that vision. Uh, one thing that's kind of went under the bridge or, or, or not gotten a lot of knowledge or traction, but it's uh, a thousand times bigger a, a, a than the moonshot for JFK going to the moon, and that is the world's first ever global moonshot, and it's the the Paris Agreement, the the 2030 agenda. More importantly than that, it's a, it's a roadmap and a plan. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, yep. targets and indicators. 
that are the world's first ever global moonshot. If you think about it, 197 countries came together for the first time ever and agreed upon a plan roadmap through backcasting, foresight, dynamic systems modeling, years of negotiation and preparation when they decide about the decided upon it in September uh, 24th, 2015. Now we're already five years into it. Uh, if you understand that that is a historical precedent, if you if you think of two countries or even two separate delegates um, deciding on where they're going to go eat lunch or what book they're going to read or uh, you know how they're going to divide up resources, they can't find their ass with both hands sometimes. Excuse my French, but it, 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 it's unheard of. 197 agreed, and, and you know we've had some some controversy, and obviously Trump and some others trying to trying to jump out of that. But that's a historical precedence, and that's that vision, that medium that that you were talking about. We, when in our generation, and you, uh, I grew up on Star Trek, and so I had this sci-fi vision of of the future, you know, no smoking, gender diversity, gender equality, and, and, you know, all these cool things that we've been able to innovate, engineer, and create those futures for the most part, fairly close, you know, general magic, we talked about it has done amazing things, Apple and many others, uh, and, and now Tesla and SpaceX, what we're seeing this year during a pandemic. Some but let, let's put a pin in that. Let's put yeah. a pin in that. Cause there's a very important piece you're getting at here, which is, even if we pulled, like just like Kyoto, we didn't sign Kyoto, yeah. but here's the thing. All the major American companies conform to it. Why? Because that's their customer base. This is, this is what I was saying in scenario three. This, I want everybody to get this, that maybe the government doesn't matter. This is a radical idea that the notion is, you look at what Michael Bloomberg has done with the Paris Agreement, right? The Paris yeah. Agreement, I think in, in most of the Fortune 500, you might, I might not be correct, but most of the Fortune 500 in this country that's headquartered here is observing it. Oh, yeah. Even though the government doesn't. So the notion is we're going to still have the same effect. I just need you to get this that that vision, I'm with you 100%, was so compelling that, that the notion is it kicked into our system as a logical uh, place to go. Yeah, I love that. That, that I mean, that succinctly uh, uh, ties it and, and and says it so well. I want to wrap up our, our conversation with, uh, it's kind of selfish, it's for my listeners. It's uh, I want you to give them three sustainable takeaways, something that's going to make their life better or help them. Um, and basically, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners, you know, this sustainable takeaway, take that has the power to change their life, what would that be? Um, I give you three of them. First of okay. all, um, the way in which we learn everything is through experience. See one, do one, teach one. So the first thing is find somebody who's doing what you want to do and apprentice yourself to them. And once that you develop mastery, find somebody who wants to do what you're doing and apprentice them. That will make you this sustainable. Two, stop thinking about what you want to do. <clears throat> it's narcissistic. It's the self-help thing run amok. Start thinking about what you're designed to do. What is it that your gifts, your natural gifts, your experience, your education, what is it that you can do? And, and do that. Do more and more of that. Finally. What are you willing to give up to grow? Everything costs something in life. Anybody tells you differently is trying to sell you something, right? The key to creativity and innovation in your life might not be doing something new. It might be stopping something old. Apprentice yourself, look at what you're designed to do and be willing to stop something to create capacity. You want to write that book? Great. Stop going to Pilates. <clears throat> you want to Build that restaurant, stop volunteering at the Humane Society. Now, I know those are all good things, but look at everything costs something. If you don't have time, you don't have capacity, you have to create it. You have to create the capacity to enliven 
your creative self. Yeah, I think uh, the more modern uh, uh, one is, uh, you know, get off of TikTok for that extra hour, two hours a day, get onto something that's, uh, you know, writing your book or doing something else. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey over these many years that you would have loved to know from the start? Smart people aren't good at learning. Some smart people think they know everything. And um, I, was a, I was a terrible high school student, came to college as a teamster, grew up in a hut house. And I went through college incredibly fast and won a bunch of awards. I was 25 when I got out with my PhD. I did, did my PhD in two years. Um, what I, what I learned was because I was such a dummy growing up, I could learn really quickly. And the people who had much better pedigrees than I did seemed to have trouble and they, they, they stopped. So, um, if you're smart, open up your mind and understand that you don't know everything. And if you don't think that you're as smart as other people, boy, you have an advantage because you're going to have a lot of room to think new thoughts. Yeah. I really encourage all my listeners to get out there and, and listen to you, your your videos and watch them and re get your book, read it. Um, it's also uh, is it is it's also available on audio, right? Yeah. yeah, and if you go to jeffdegraff.com, just jeffdegraff.com, there's a page which you click on it and all the resources are there. So the videos, it's all and it's all free. I'm not going to bother you. I didn't build it for that. I built it so if you wanted to start a business or work with your classroom or whatever, it's free. That's the reason for doing it. So oh, it's great if you buy the book, please. If you got, if you got the resource to buy the book, great. If you don't, there's also stuff there for you. A lot of the companies that listen, I, I deal a lot with Fortune 1000 companies and have a lot of futurist innovators that are gonna run out and grab it. They definitely wanna have it. And you'll probably receive some follow-ups uh, uh, from them asking you to, to come and be on their show. I, I really like uh, if we could maybe do do a follow up in in a few months and have Sandy if she's interested. I'd, I we didn't even get to talk about your innovation center and and what she does. And, and she, and so, she runs everything. And she, yeah, she, she uh, like, she's far smarter than her husband. So you should just know that the fabulous. boss the boss of all this is uh that she's a diminutive, uh, bright, beautiful, and and bossy lady. I, I think you guys All are of a my power, life, power I've married couple. Forever. <laughs> been married to forever. But you should know she's kind of, she runs everything. Not That's me. fabulous. Yeah, she. you guys are a power couple and I really like uh, what I've heard her speak before and, 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 and heard what she does. And we'll have to get together and talk a little bit more about that. Hey, Jeff, it's been so wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much. And let's do this again soon. Mark, thanks for having me. This was a real treat. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.